We're cracking down on unfair trade deals. We're taking strong action to secure our border, stop illegal immigration, and restore the rule of law. And we've passed the biggest tax cut and reform in American history. More than 5 million workers have already received a tax cut bonus, a pay raise, or a new job thanks to these really massive tax cuts. Millions more. <laughs> Millions more are getting higher take-home pay. No one has been more energized by our tax cuts than American manufacturers. With us today is the president of the National Association of Manufacturers, Jay Timmons. Where's Jay? Jay, stand up, Jay. Thank you, Jay. For 20 years, their organization has surveyed American manufacturers all over the country, they survey. And it's a great organization. And they have never before seen the levels of optimism that our tax cuts have delivered. Is that a correct statement, Jay? It's dangerous to ask you that, because if you say no, I have a problem. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. It's true. So true. In fact, today, there is even more good news, and I wanted all of you to be the first to hear it. According to the latest survey by the National Association of Manufacturers, projected job growth for American manufacturing has just reached a new all-time high. So you think about that, the oil at 10 million barrels, and you think about the manufacturing. All you used to hear is that we're losing our manufacturing jobs. Jobs are being taken out of the country. They're coming back, and they're coming back fast. Projections for capital investment and wage growth have also set new all-time records. And we're just getting started. There is enthusiasm like we've never seen before. Companies from all over the world are coming back to the United States. Apple is investing $350 billion, with a B, $350 billion in an incredible campus and plants. So many other companies, far too many to name. And what they're really doing is giving their workers thousands and thousands of dollars of bonuses, something that we never really expected. Nobody thought of it. We did the tax cuts. We thought you'd have to wait till February. But you started seeing them very early because hundreds and even actually thousands of companies were giving massive numbers of whatever you want to call it. What would you call it, Mike? The thousands of dollars. What would you call that? We can't say it's a gift because they're workers. We can't say it's a tax because it's not a tax. But they were getting a lot of money, and every, I mean, so many, and a lot of companies didn't want to do it. And the people working for the company said, what about us? And they did it. They had no choice. In fact, another great announcement to share with you as well. Today, I will sign a presidential memorandum directing the EPA to cut even more red tape on our manufacturers. So that they can expand and continue to hire and to grow. And I will say, this is about tax cuts today, but the cutting of regulations could have had the same or even a bigger impact on our economy. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. People were stuck. They'd have a factory, it would be under review for 10 years, 12 years, and then get rejected. You've seen what we've done with the pipelines and so many businesses all over our country that are being approved rapidly. We're getting highway approvals down from 2017, 15, 12, 10 years. We're getting them down to one year and two years. We're going to get the highways approved quickly. We're going to get our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our schools. 
No, no more waiting 18 to 20 years to get an approval. And then, by the way, they don't get the approval. And you may not get the approval, but it's going to be quick. It'll be a quick rejection. <laughs> but you'll get them, for the most part. And we will take care of our environment. Remember that. We'll take just as good, if not better, care of our environment. And we'll have better roads and better bridges and better schools. We're bringing back our factories. We're bringing back our jobs. And we're bringing back those four really beautiful words that you don't hear very much. We used to hear that 30 years ago. I won't say any more than that because I don't want to date myself. But 40 years ago, 50 years ago, it was called Made in the USA. Do you remember? Yeah. Made in the USA. We're bringing it back. We used to hear that all the time. Now you're starting to hear it again. We know that. Today, we have workers here from almost 50 American companies. I'd like to invite a few of you up here, and you're already up for the most part, to share the American people and with all of the folks that are here how the tax cuts have improved your lives. And we've had some incredible — we've had some incredible stories, actually. Joining us today are Derek Leathers and Quinton Ward with Werner Trucking in Omaha, Nebraska. Great place, great state. Where are you? Derek, Derek, Derek. Oh, he's a big guy. Come here, Derek. How about saying a few words, please? Thank you, Mr. President. Tax reform has already produced real benefits at Werner. Trucking is the engine that keeps America moving. And with the tax cuts, we've been able to increase our capital investment this year by $127 million, 90 percent of which is dedicated to trucks and trailers that are cleaner, safer, and better for the American roadways. We've also increased and announced increases of $24 million for our 9,500 driver associates. That works out to over $2,400 per professional driver. That was President Trump. He's pitching his tax plan and talking about the good economic news that keeps on coming. Meanwhile, President Trump's choice to lead the State Department, Mike Pompeo, in the hot seat today at the Senate, while the White House is now saying it is confident Syria used chemical weapons on its own people. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. We are now awaiting a national security meeting set to begin at the White House at the bottom of the hour where the president will hear options for responding to Syria. We have live Fox team coverage. Rich Edson is at the State Department, where he's been following the Pompeo hearings. But we begin with Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon with the latest on Syria. Jennifer. Dana, that national security meeting was supposed to begin at the White House in about 30 minutes. The pre-scheduled defense hearing on the Hill just ended after four hours. Mattis said repeatedly this morning when pressed, no decisions have been taken yet regarding military strikes against Syria. He did go further than he did yesterday as to whether a chemical weapons attack had occurred. I believe there was a chemical attack, and we're looking for the actual evidence. The, uh, the OPCW, this is the Organization for the uh, Chemical uh, Weapons Convention. We're trying to get those inspectors in probably uh, within the week. You know the challenges we face where Russia has six times in the UN uh, rejected and uh, made certain that uh, we could not get uh, in investigators in. The OPCW just announced they hope to have their inspectors on the ground working in Syria on Saturday, this Saturday, April 14th. That could interfere with the timing of a possible missile strike. In the meantime, the U.S.'s Donald Cook is off the coast of Syria with about 75 Tomahawk missiles on board and more than a dozen surface-to-air missiles. It is joined by at least one British submarine armed with cruise missiles. The British cabinet signed off on the British joining the U.S. and French efforts earlier today. The French have deployed a frigate to the eastern Mediterranean armed with 16 cruise missiles and another 16 surface-to-air missiles. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, has ordered British submarines to move into position to help. The USS Harry S. Truman departed Norfolk, Virginia yesterday, accompanied by seven U.S. warships and should be in the Eastern Med within a week. I'm so pleased and proud 
of the Harry S. Truman Carrier Strike Group Team, 6,500 of uh, the finest Americans you could ever sail with or serve with. Uh, we're trained, we're ready, any mission, anytime, anywhere, we're ready to go. Fox News has also learned there are U.S. warships in the Red Sea in striking range of Syria as well. The question is, what good, if any, would a Tomahawk missile strike do? The, exactly a year ago, it had no impact on Assad's thinking. Dana? Jennifer, I just wanted to press you on the, on the question. So Secretary Mattis is saying that it was chemical weapons. Is the issue now trying to figure out who actually deployed them, or do they know who did it? Well, it's interesting because we've seen heard a little bit of contradiction. On the one hand, he said for the first time that he's confident that chemical weapons were used. He said they're still looking for evidence, and that's why those OPCW UN inspectors are going in. But he also said in the same breath that the more time that goes by, those chemicals dissipate. So it's not clear what, uh, what those inspectors will find once they've been there. Remember, the Russians have already been on the ground in Douma mm -hmm. and probably have cleaned up any of the evidence there. There were reports, eyewitness reports of canisters and helicopters that had launched those canisters that they say, you know, had either the chlorine or some sort of nerve agent in them. Uh, we are hearing reports, but we cannot confirm at this time that some of the groups, the human rights groups on the ground have collected samples uh, from hospitals uh, that may indicate mm -hmm. some sort of nerve agent was used. But again, we can't confirm that at this time, and nor is uh, Defense Secretary Mattis publicly confirming that. Okay, Jennifer, thank you. And Secretary of State nominee Mike Pompeo is getting grilled for hours at his Senate confirmation hearing. During testimony, Pompeo talked about what his priority would be if confirmed. Job number one is to represent the president. For me, this means building substantial relationships with our allies, relationships that President Trump and I can utilize for both tough conversations and productive cooperation. It also means working with our adversaries where needed to make clear objectives and let them know the means by which we intend to achieve them. Rich Edson has been following the Pompeo hearings. Rich, there's plenty of focus on Iran. Uh, absolutely, Dana. Iran and the Iran nuclear agreement. Director Pompeo, there's an assumption that he's going to push the United States to get out of the Iran nuclear deal. But what Pompeo says is that he plans on working with European allies to try to change Iran policy in an attempt to perhaps keep the United States in the deal. And the argument from Democrats and a number of Republicans is that Iran has already received the benefits of this deal and that by if the United States would withdraw from the agreement, then Iran could get the benefits and then continue continue its nuclear program, but he pushed back on that notion. Senator, they're, they're still receiving enormous economic benefits, even as we sit here this morning. Right. So, so there is continued, uh, so there is continued interest on the part of Iran to stay in this deal. He also talked about Syria. He said that the United States, he believes in the president right now, has the existing authority to launch an attack in Syria if requested. Also, he confirmed publicly that the U.S. military killed hundreds of Russians in a fight in Syria. So a number of international questions, also some domestic questions. This mostly coming from Democrats about the Mueller investigation. Uh, Pompeo confirms that he was interviewed by the special counsel's office. He also says that uh, he really can't comment all that much about it. Democrats are trying to get him on some of the comments that President Trump had made disparaging the investigation. He refused to comment on a lot of it because he says the CIA is currently involved in that investigation. I have worked diligently myself and I have put demands on the team that works for me to go out of our way to make sure we were delivering for each of those three investigations. And if I'm confirmed that the State Department, we'll do it there as well. In a response to a question, he also says he probably would not resign if the president fired Robert Mueller. Back to you. All right, Rich, thank you. Coming up next, General Jack Keane joins me for a reaction on both the breaking news from the White House on Syria and the Mike Pompeo hearing on Capitol Hill. What is your view? Is it better to pull out of an agreement that Iran is in compliance with if we can't fix it? Or is it better to stay in the agreement? Uh, yes or no? I think no, Senator, it's not, it's not a yes or no question it's because it's a hypothetical. We're not at that point. Let, let me tell you. I'll the president has to certify on May the 12th. Yes, sir. That's, that's, a, that's yet almost a month away. If there's no chance that we can fix it, I will recommend to the president that we do our level best to work with our allies to achieve a better 
outcome and a better deal. That's Senator Ben Cardin questioning Secretary of State nominee Mike Pompeo on his stance on the Iran deal. This is White House officials are set to meet soon to discuss the situation in Syria as the administration now says it is confident that Syria used chemical weapons. Let's bring in retired four-star General Jack Keene, a Fox News senior strategic analyst. I'll start with Iran, sir. So we are a month from today when the president has to make a decision about recertifying the Iran deal. Um, lots of questions about this for Mike Pompeo today. He's living, leaving himself a little wiggle room. What's he trying to signal there? Well, first of all, we are going to work with our, our allies who are signatories to the deal. And we've done some spade work already uh, with them, and, and we know a few things. Here's, here's what we're trying to do, to be specific. One is we want to add ballistic missiles as a prohibition to the deal. Two, we want to add the military secret sites and have access by inspectors to the deal. And our, our European allies will go along with that. But the third thing is we want to, we want to eliminate the so-called sunset clauses mm -hmm. for the sake of our audience. And 10 years down the road from the initiation of the deal, they can, the Iranians can move to a threshold nuclear capability. 15 years down the road, there's a clear pathway to a nuclear weapon. We want to change that. Mm -hmm. and fix that. The Europeans will not agree to do that, Dana. Mm -hmm. And if that holds over the next 30 days, then the United States, come May 12th, will pull out pull of out. this deal. Uh, meantime, Secretary Mattis has said that the United States does confirm that chemical weapons were used in Syria. There is a question, as Jennifer Griffin was just explaining, about how exactly they were released and who was responsible. If you could listen to the French President, Emmanuel Macron, on what he says he knows. We have proof that last week, now nearly 10 days ago, that chemical weapons were used, at least chlorine, and that they were used by Bashar al-Assad's regime. We have to remove the means of using chemical weapons from the regime. We will have decisions to make. In due time, we will judge what is the most useful and most efficient. Based on your experience, sir, take us behind the scenes and what's happening now as the president is getting recommendations from his military advisors. Yeah, well, first of all, when, when it comes to the act, who did this, we know exactly who did it because we have AWACS airplanes, which is a, a radar aircraft that tracks all flights. We, if you're going down a runway in Syria, we, can, we see that. If, if you take off a helicopter from a runway, we see it. We track the entire flight. When, when they deliver ordnance to the target, we know that's taken place. So we know that a Syrian regime helicopter flew over this area and delivered ordnance. We don't know what was inside that ordnance. We know from what happened to the victims and studying the pictures of the victims and compare them to other victims had exposure to chlorine and nerve gas that it's likely that these agents were indeed used. So that's why there's this degree of confidence about what has taken place. What's going on right now with the president and his national security team is they're deciding on two things. Number one, the scope the scope of the response by the United States and our coalition partners. In other words, how, how big, how comprehensive, mm -hmm. what's the scale of this thing going to be? And number two, the timing of it. And right now we're positioning assets also, but I think the assets are likely to be pretty close to being in place. So it is, now we're just waiting for a presidential decision. All right, that is helpful for us to understand what's going on. General Jack Keane, thank you. Good talking to you, Dana. Mike Pompeo getting grilled over why the United States wasn't in the meeting with Iran, Russia, and Turkey to talk about Syria's strategy. Senator Lindsey Graham is up next to react to that and the situation in Syria. Fox News alert on what the White House is now calling a chemical attack in Syria. As the president moves closer to a decision on military action, senators are questioning his choice for Secretary of State on Syria. On April 4th, uh, this picture was taken. Can you tell me what's wrong with the photo? Senator, you'll have to help me. Okay. I I've seen this picture before, or a similar picture. I would hope you could tell me what's wrong, but here I'll, I'll give it to you in the interest of time. What's wrong is that the, Amer uh, the United States of America isn't there. 
Let's bring in South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham. Mike Pompeo is answering a lot of questions today. Yeah. That in particular was this concern that uh, the United States is not at the table trying to figure out this problem. But the problem is super complex, lots of different moving parts. How do you see it as it stands now at 2.25 p.m.? I think Mike Pompeo is an outstanding choice to be Secretary of State. Uh, we need to be involved in what happens to Syria, not turn it over to the Russians, Iranians, or Turkey. But let me just say to Bob Mendez, my friend, I voted for John Kerry, understanding exactly how many times I disagreed with him because I thought he was qualified. Bob, Mike Pompeo was first in his class in West Point. Mm -hmm. He was an Army officer. Uh, he went to Harvard Law School. He's been the CIA director. He's been a member of Congress who's traveled all over the world with myself and Senator McCain. He's an outstanding choice. He has the confidence of the president, a CIA director. He understands the world for what it is. He is not a libertarian, so I can understand why Rand Paul doesn't like him. He's not a liberal Democrat. He is a solid conservative Republican that I think is highly qualified, and I hope he gets bipartisan support. Well, and if he is confirmed, this issue about what's happening and going to happen in Syria will not be going away anytime soon. He's right. going to have to deal with it. Um, this morning, a president uh, tweeted. Can something I just new. add something? Sure. As CIA director, he has been dealing with it. Of course. There's no doubt in my mind that Mike Pompeo understands the threats we face, believes that diplomacy is a tool in the toolbox. And He's he been said in the military that. Office. Yes. And, he, and, you know, and he said that. He said it's important that the State Department be, sure. uh, that the morale be improved, that the ranks yes. be filled, that they make sure that they have everything they need so that military action is not as uh, uh, needed. However, the president today, this morning, tweeting an update to this situation, and he said, never said when an attack on Syria would take place could be very soon or not so soon at all. In any event, the United States under my administration has done a great job of ridding the region of ISIS. Where is our thank you, America? What I want to ask you about is another question that Pompeo has uh, received uh, repeatedly, which is what is the congressional responsibility here? Does the Congress need to weigh in or do you think, um, based on your experience and of course your legal experience, yeah. that the president has the authority he needs to take action that he says is coming? Well, I've been a military lawyer for 33 years. Uh, the War Powers Act was passed by Congress during the, right after the Vietnam War. I don't think it's worth the papers written on. The Obama administration said that the Congressional War Powers Act uh, encroaches on the Article II powers of the Commander in Chief. We've declared war in the history of the country congressionally five times. We've been in numerous military conflicts without declaring war and without authorization to use military force. This president can. Uh, take on a rogue regime like Assad who violated the chemical weapons uh, ban. He can come to the aid of our friends in Israel who are facing threats from Syria. He has all the authority he needs as commander in chief. And if the Congress doesn't like this military action, you can defund it, but you can't, mm -hmm. you can't have 535 commander in chiefs. You can't take away that power. Right. Um, what, my last question to you then is something I just talked to General Jack Keene about, yeah. which is this question about um, we know now that our State Department, I'm sorry, our Defense Department, Secretary Mattis says that there was chemical weapons used against the people of Duma right. last weekend in, uh, in right. Syria. The question I, for some people still remains, are we sure that it was Assad's forces that did it? Do you know f for sure that it was Assad? You don't need Sherlock Holmes to figure this out. Number one, be as bold as the French. You'll never go wrong. The French president is sure. The helicopter flew over the town. It was a Syrian helicopter. Something was dropped from the helicopter, and the people on the ground reacted to that something like it was a chemical attack. Let me tell you what President Trump thinks. He believes it was Syria. If he didn't believe that, why would he tweet out, you're going to pay a big price, you animal Assad. You kill uh, children with a chemical attack. You're going to pay a big price. The President Trump has to believe it's Assad. If he doesn't believe it's Assad, that's the most reckless statement any president's ever made. I'm convinced it's Assad, but here's what I'm not convinced of. I'm not convinced that Assad's going to pay a big price. And mm. if Assad doesn't pay a big price, we will. I'll let you leave it there as the last word. All right, Senator Lindsey Graham, thank you. Thank you. Well, he's only been on the job a few days, but John Bolton is already making big changes, what they are and the impact they could have. Plus a dramatic confirmation hearing for Mike Pompeo as the president's pick for secretary of state outlines his plans for dealing with North Korea, Iran and the crisis in Syria. 
how lawmakers are responding. I, to working with you. I, I do believe it will be important that Mike Pompeo, I don't know, he's just a brilliant guy. With the experience he has, he's ready to go. Secretary of Defense James Mattis, uh, James Mattis just arriving at the White House moments ago to discuss the options in Syria with the president. The White House today saying it is confident chemical weapons were used in the attack. And after just a few days on the job, White House National Security Advisor John Bolton is already making some major moves. Jillian Turner is live in Washington with that story. Jillian. Hey, Dana. So President Trump's brand new national security advisor, John Bolton, has hit the ground running over at the White House this week. He's already making some major moves to consolidate control over U.S. foreign policy. His opening bid, ensuring that his is the primary voice in the president's ear when it comes to both national and homeland security. I have my views. Uh, I'm sure I'll have a chance to articulate them to the president. Uh, some people don't like people who have substantive views. Uh, they're uh, more process oriented. Uh, but it's, uh, if, if the government can't have a free interchange of ideas among the president's advisors, then I think the president is not well served. National security experts tell Fox News the ouster of Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert may be a first step towards a complete merge of the National Security and Homeland Security Councils, the two most important offices inside the White House when it comes to making U.S. foreign policy. This move may sound like just another wonky development for Washington insiders to chew over, but it's actually got some serious implications for U.S. policy overseas. With Bossert out, Bolton now manages the former Homeland Security Advisor's portfolio. This includes counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and border security issues. Surprisingly, some Obama senior national security officials think it's a good move. You want people to argue with the president, to give him, give him good, strong advice, uh, and then ultimately they will have to salute when he makes the decision. But it doesn't serve the president or the country well to have a bunch of yes men around him. Given Bolton's tough stances on China, Russia, Iran, combating terrorism, and even nuclear development, insiders predict Dana were in for an even more aggressive policy on all these ranges of issues. Dana? Indeed. All right. Thank you, Jillian. Thanks. And back to our top story, the confirmation hearings for Secretary of State nominee Mike Pompeo. I'm joined by Adam Airely, former U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain and a former Deputy State Department spokesman. Adam, thanks for joining with me today. Listen real quickly to what um, Mike Pompeo said that he believes his role at the State Department would be. Throughout my time in Congress, and I've met hundreds of State Department employees. I know them. Uh, and in the past few weeks, I've had to get a chance to meet dozens and dozens more in briefings to a person they expressed to me, their hope to be empowered in their roles and to have a clear understanding of the president's mission. That'll be my first priority. It's reported that the State Department morale is down in the dumps. Is that what you're hearing? And what do you think that he can do to try to uh, improve on that? Well, yeah, I mean, clearly the the morale of the State Department was, was hurt by Tillerson and Tillerson's disregard for the career diplomats, the career foreign service officers, and his failure, interestingly, to defend the State Department budget on the Hill. Mm -hmm. um, what Mike Pompeo says is encouraging, uh, and I, th I would look at it this way, you know, to, to reiterate what some of your previous guests said. You know, the State Department is a tool of national power like the Department of Defense and like the CIA. So why would you want to unilaterally disarm by by depriving the State Department of the resources and the personnel that it needs to do the nation's business. I think Pompeo understands that. I think he's going to fight for the State Department because he wants as powerful a tool, as powerful a weapon as he can have to do the business of the State Department and the United States. And then looking forward, to, you know, we've been talking in this hour about the possible action against Syria for that chemical weapons attack, amongst other things. I mean, it's a very complicated uh, political situation there with all these different countries having their interests fought out on this small piece of uh, land. You're an expert in the Middle East. And I'm curious what you think that the State Department and Mike Pompeo in particular, if he is confirmed, needs to do because after the attack, if there is one, there has to be some sort of political or diplomatic solution. Well, you're absolutely right, and you know again, you know one of the one of the one of the aspects of this attack that have not been talked about is what are the objectives? In other words, what are we trying to accomplish by this attack? 
And I would also point to one other aspect of the issue that hasn't gotten a lot of coverage, which is the coalition that we're building. I mean, look, Macron has said they're going to go into it. Uh, Theresa May has had a meeting with her cabinet today. Uh, president talked to uh, Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, which shares a large northern border uh, or southern border, southern Turkish mm -hmm. border, northern Syrian border with, uh, with Syria. So the fact of the matter is, even before this attack, and I do believe there will be an attack, uh, the State Department and U.S. diplomats are helping to coordinate the international diplomacy of our partners who I believe will participate in the attack. Hmm. This will not be the United States going it alone. Were you surprised when um, everyone sort of took a hands-off approach when Israel reacted last weekend? No, I mean, uh, Israel's been doing what it needs to do for some time. Uh, and clearly it was coordinated with us, but uh, Israel, I, mean, I think everybody understands, and Senator Graham pointed out this very clearly, that Israel is under unprecedented threat from what's happening in Syria, mostly because Iran now runs that country. And now they run Lebanon and Syria, mm. and Israel faces a new front in its fight to preserve the existence of the Jewish state. Indeed. All right, Ambassador Adam Early, I'm glad you were here today. Thank you. Thank you. So what does Speaker of the House Paul Ryan's announcement that he will not run again mean for the GOP as it moves forward? Our panel will weigh in. We have a very strong leadership team. That's one of the reasons why I, I was take, took comfort in making this decision, because I know there's a capable leadership team I can hand the gavel on to. Shepard Smith on the Fox News deck waiting for President Trump's decision on Syria and whether the U.S. will strike. The Defense Secretary James Mattis at the White House right now. I'll speak with a former CIA military analyst about the military options and the possible consequences. Also keeping an eye on Capitol Hill and confirmation hearing for Mike Pompeo, President Trump's nominee to be the next Secretary of State. And speaking of Syria, how did that start again? It was a civil war until we entered it and we're still in it and we're fighting the Russians and we'll explain top of the hour on Shepard Smith reporting. See you then. I feel like our majority's in good hands. The president's given us this chance to get a lot done, which we've gotten a lot done. I don't think anybody's election is going to hinge on whether or not Paul Ryan is the Speaker of the House. I think we're going to have a strong record to run on. We're going to have the resources to communicate our story. So I feel very good about things. That's how Speaker Paul Ryan brushing aside claims that his departure will hurt Republicans in the midterm elections. A bigger question, who will take his place if Republicans hold the House in November? Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise are seen as the front runners. Joining us now is Terry Holt, a founder and partner at HDMK, and Marianne Marsh, a former senior advisor to Secretary John Kerry and a principal at Dewey Square Group. Terry, I guess one of the questions would be, do Scalise and McCarthy, if they're going to run for this, do they think they're running to be speaker or minority leader? Well, that's a very good question because I think it depends a great deal on who the candidate for speaker will be. If prospects look good hmm. uh, for Republicans in the fall, then I think there might be more competition for the job because it's much better to be speaker than it is to be minority leader. And I think that what the Republicans are trying to do today on Capitol Hill with Paul Ryan pushing back a little bit on people <clears throat> attempting to get him out of office early uh, with Scalise saying that he's not going to run against Kevin McCarthy. Uh, it, it looks to me like the Republicans at least have an ascension plan in place. And this announcement was only made yesterday. Whenever an announcement of this significance comes about, uh, the Republican conference needs to take a few days to digest it. But I'll tell you what, I've talked to more Democrats around town. And frankly, with our at least plan in place for an ascension mm -hmm. or a succession, the Democrats kind of wished that they had a plan in place and that maybe Nancy Pelosi had made the announcement that Paul Ryan made yesterday. And what, yeah, what do you think of that, Marianne? There is some people that think that Nancy Pelosi could do the Democrats a big favor in their goal to try to win back the House if she were to step aside, say, around the July 4th recess. Make no mistake about it. The Democrats are going to win the House back and Nancy Pelosi will be Speaker. She's the most underestimated politician on Capitol Hill period, end of sentence. And Kevin McCarthy knows that if he allows
Paul Ryan to stay through January of 2019, he will never be speaker. Hmm. He knows that. So that politics abhors a vacuum. When Paul Ryan announced that he wasn't going to run, that he's retiring, that opened up a vacuum the size of the Grand Canyon. And now everyone's looking to fill it. And Paul Ryan has been a weakened speaker ever since Donald Trump got into the White House. So I have no doubt it'll be very surprising if Paul Ryan makes it past the summer. And you have other shoes to drop. There's at least 10 more Republicans who are going to announce their retirements. And you I, have more shoes to drop in the Mueller investigation. Mm -hmm. A lot's going to happen, and it makes it very tough to hang on if you're Paul Speaking Ryan. Speaking of the Mueller investigation, take a listen to what Congressman Nadler said earlier today. The president, like everyone else, is subject to the law, and he should know that he will be held accountable to the law. Statements like these, reports that the president has considered numerous times over the past year firing Mr. Mueller, and threats from congressional Republicans to quote-unquote impeach DOJ officials, Department of Justice officials, who refuse to cooperate in their conspiracy theories, are clear threats to the rule of law. And yet, Terry, do you think that some Democrats actually would like for the president to fire Bob Mueller, the special counsel, because, you know, it would create all of these problems for him? Absolutely. The, the people who are looking at this with the greatest uh, uh, anticipation are Democrats that wish that Donald Trump would just pull the tr trigger on, on Robert Mueller and go for it, because that would perhaps weaken the president in the eyes of some parts of the electorate. But mm -hmm. I actually think that, that the bill that's being considered in the Senate today is kind of a way to let some of the air out of the balloon. There is quite a bit, quite a bit of strong sentiment that uh, Mueller be protected on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. But Mitch McConnell has not guaranteed that that bill yeah. would ever find a place on the floor of the Senate. So, yeah, right. so the president, it, it might not ever even reach to him. I, but they're trying to tell me i got to move on, Marianne. So let me just give it over to you for a final last word. Look, the fact here is Donald Trump, it's not a coincidence that Donald Trump tweeted about an hour ago saying he had confidence in Mueller, the process, and in his own attorney. It's also not a coincidence that he happened to meet with Rod Rosenstein this afternoon at the White House for regular business. That's because this legislation's on the table. He does not want to be handcuffed, so he could fire Mueller. He's made it plain clear he's, he's considered it in the past. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't want the handcuffs of that law either. That's why he's done this. He wants the option to get rid of him, and that would Great. be bad for the country. So maybe for the next 24 hours, we we can all put aside the idea that he's going to fire Mueller and talk about other things. Maybe all right, Terry Holt can. and Marianne Marsh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. A new reading on the outlook for Republicans in November, why this could be the toughest midterm elections for the GOP since 2006. And boy, do I remember that. A dire new warning for Republicans, a super PAC supporting Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, explaining why Republicans can expect the toughest midterm since 2006 when the party lost both the House and the Senate. Stephen Law is president and CEO of the Senate Leadership Fund. I remember 2006 well, I'm sure you do too, and that means mm -hmm. that when you're in politics, you never really rest easy. However, Quinnipiac today is showing that the Republicans are doing better in the congressional ballot, um, narrowing the Rep Democrats' lead by about three points. Um, Democrats at 46, Republicans at 43 percent. So why, what is keeping you up at night? Well, I'm always happy to hear positive news, but there are some larger trends that we've been seeing, particularly in special elections and in the elections we saw in Virginia last fall that give us a lot of concern. We're seeing sky high democratic enthusiasm, which is reflected in high turnout. Also very, very robust fundraising numbers for their candidates. Uh, in addition to that, obviously a lot of retirements in the House, including uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. a particularly noteworthy one with Speaker Ryan. Uh, and then in addition to that, the party as a whole is losing ground, especially with uh, suburban women voters, more educated, uh, higher income women. And we've, we're going to have to do an awful lot, particularly to hold the House. The, the Senate, a different matter. We've, we've got better terrain that we're fighting on there, relatively few seats to defend compared to the Democrats. Uh, but it's going to be a very, very challenging election for Republicans. Earlier this week, you, uh, as Republicans, uh, considered it good news that Governor Rick Scott was getting into that Senate race. Meantime, in West Virginia, there are several Republicans trying to win the primary there to run against Joe Manchin. Are you concerned that they will not be able to do that if they don't nominate the person that can best beat him? 
Right. Uh, you mentioned Rick Scott. Uh, we think uh, his entry into the race uh, turns that from a uh, kind of a nothing burger race into one of probably our top prospects for a pickup. Uh, Bill Nelson has had the good fortune of running against second rate candidates for most of his career and his lucky streak ended this week with uh, Governor Scott entering into that race and we're going to be mm -hmm. very involved there. Uh, there are some states where we're concerned about primaries and the wrong candidate getting nominated. West Virginia being one where uh, we could end up not putting our best foot forward there. Also Mississippi uh, where we're going to be defending the Thad Cochran seat. We're concerned about Chris McDaniel being the nominee there. If he is that nominee we expect Democrats to make a play for that one in the same way that they did against Roy Moore mm -hmm. uh, in in uh, Alabama. And then take me to North Dakota. Ken Kramer, uh, Kevin Kramer, excuse me, uh, raised $1.3 million in the first quarter of that race. Heidi Heitkamp, the senator, the incumbent, the Democrat in, the, in that very red state, raised $1.6 million. I'll tell you what, I sometimes think I should have gone into being a media buyer for political campaigns because that's where all this money is going to be spent. How do you spend that much money in North Dakota to try to win a race? Well, you spend it as carefully as you can. Uh, you know, one of the things about uh, North Dakota in particular is there are only so many TV stations to buy. If you spent $10 million, you'd be buying, uh, you know, the, the Cartoon Network. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty darn amazing. The thing that's amazing about what uh, Kevin Kramer was able to accomplish was that he pretty much evenly matched his uh, Democratic opponent uh, yeah. dollar for dollar in fundraising, despite the fact, uh, many people don't know this, he had a, a family tragedy and he, he pressed on mm -hmm. through and, and, and yet still was able to post uh, amazing numbers. We think he's going to be a great candidate. Heidi Heitkamp is a, is a strong uh, incumbent. She works the state, but we think that Kevin Kramer is going to be a tremendous challenger in that race. Well, uh, no doubt the Republicans have their work cut out for them, but it sounds like the Democrats do as well. All right, Stephen Law, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Great to be on. And we'll be right back.